Hey, so we have the pleasure of speaking with Deirdre Imus, president and founder of the Deirdre Imus Environmental Health Center at Hackensack University Medical Center. She's also the co-founder, co-director of the once Imus Cattle Ranch uh, for Kids with Cancer. Deirdre, thank you for being here and taking the time out from sunny Texas to talk to us all the way out here in New York. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. So just so people who are listening know, we already had the pleasure of going to the center. It was so cool and so amazing. Your team there is so passionate about what you're doing. Um, but you got you to gotta step back for us and tell us, how did this idea even start? This whole notion of you know, greening the cleaning, your cleaning products, changing the world. How did it start? It started with uh, working with all these children that have cancer. Um, and going back to my husband raising money for the Tomorrow's Children's Fund, which is an, an amazing organization at Hackensack University Medical Center that helps all these families and children that are diagnosed with cancer. And um, by working with these families and these children, uh, I started to notice uh, several things, you know, and also what causes cancer, because we do focus in this country on you know, after someone gets cancer, what do we do? But not the root cause or prevention. And being in the hospital and thinking about all these kids that came to our ranch, which we started in 1998, uh, my husband and I founded uh, the Imus Cattle Ranch for Kids with Cancer. And there back in 1998, we were ahead of the curve with knowing that we wanted to eliminate any toxins possible. I just was very interested um, and really educated myself on a lot of those topics with pesticides and cleaning products and baby products, et cetera, of the knowledge that I had back then, because so much has happened since then that we know a lot more. No, but, but, anyway, but you were like, yeah. a, you were kind of on the forefront of this. Like, did something happen? Did your son, Wyatt, and we're talking, so everyone knows that your husband is Don Imus, Imus in the morning radio show, 770 WABC. But so did Wyatt get sick and you say, what the heck? Or did he have allergies? Like, what was the catalyst that made you even get interested in this stuff? No, and thank God that's not what happened. Right. And that, yes, that usually is the story when someone finds an organization or does something. It really was just being aware and then uh, work, seeing and working with the Tomorrow's Children's Fund and asking myself questions. And one of them was, they're in this hospital environment. Are hospitals places of healing? Are their physical environment places that they can heal? And I quickly found out that no, they weren't. And this is all hospitals. It's the way they're set up. And they're, they, frankly, no one had really thought about it. And so I asked about cleaning products because I was already using non-toxic, um, which I call green now. That word green wasn't used back then. And um, I put together a bunch of research about um, hospital environments and the cleaning products they use. And of course, in hospitals, because of infectious diseases and you know all the different patients and transfer of different things and, and, and how easy it is to spread um, disease, infections, viruses, et cetera, pathogens. Um, do we really have to be using all those standard toxic cleaning agents that we've been using all these years, especially since you know the Industrial Revolution with all the chlorine bleaches and really toxic substances that are used in hospitals. And so I asked that question first and I started doing my homework and then I presented it really to Hackensack with the idea. My idea was what if we could implement non-toxic or green products into hospitals? Wouldn't that be the highest level in our society to set an example for everyone in their home, businesses, schools, et cetera, if hospitals were saying yes, it's right and it's healthy to use these green products, but the key is, do they work as well? Right. So right. we did this whole you know, um, evaluation, had them tested by the allergy and immunology department as well as third party testing. And of course, now this is 16 years ago or more, 17 years ago, back in 2000, we started this, or I started this with the hospital. And um, we found that the green products were um, just as effective and sometimes even better. They worked as, as well, if not better. And we initially saw a cost reduction. So of course, anyone, you know, bottom line numbers, budget numbers, that's always important for any business. And as soon as we saw that we were willing, we were able to save the hospital money too. So that's where the beginning of the genesis of, which, which we called and we now have it, the greening, the cleaning program. 
And that started in 2001, spring of 2001, where we successfully implemented the entire campus at Hackensack. And they were the first. But did you march into, so Bob Garrett was the president at the time, right? Did you like just- I was the president at the time, wasn't. John. And Bob Garrett was the VP though. Okay. And it's their decision to, um, and I, Bob Garrett is the uh, president and CEO, co-CEO now, because now they've merged with Meridian Health Systems. So it's an even larger uh, system and hospital. But they, from day one, when I went in and presented the information, totally understood and it totally made common sense. And if we can prove all this, then of course, then it's safe to implement. And that's really the beginnings. I mean, thank God we had leaders and Bob Garrett's an incredible leader. And as you can see now, there's many, we've won uh, practice green health, you know, for three or four years in a row now, I think it's three years in a row. One of the greenest hospitals, because we've now continued and built an entire environmental health center and we're unique too because we're the one of the first hospital-based programs to actually do this, which is very hard to do in a hospital. So out of the Greening the Cleaning program came the Deirdre Imus Environmental Health Center. Uh, it was originally called uh, the Deirdre Imus uh, Environmental Pediatric Oncology Center because we were focused specifically just on children with cancer, um, our mission. But then we realized there are we have the sickest generation. We have so many children that are so sick with, you know, all these other things that are epi epi epidemic too. Right. So um, we expanded, but the mission stays the same from day one. And our mission is to identify control and ultimately prevent environmental toxins that may cause our children to be sick. So it just fundamentally makes sense. And how we apply that is through our education system, um, educational practices, our implementation, starting with Green and the Cleaning, which we're successfully doing not only in our own hospital, but in hundreds of other facilities that are hospitals, businesses, schools, uh, restaurants, you name it, you know, any public uh, building, uh, pretty much, um, and through our research as well. And that's really where it started, and it started with having strong leadership, seeing that vision that Bob Garrett sees and continues to see um, and how our, our our environmental health center at the hospital is so successful. But I think it's a, it's a testament to you too, because look, you got in the door, right? Because of what you and your husband were doing with these kids to begin with. And you, you use that to your benefit because I, you know, people could be sitting at home saying, I, I say all the time, sometimes like, you know, you're in restaurants and you feel like things are blowing at you and you come out and you're sick and People don't care, but they, they listened somehow. I mean, you made them listen, and that's a huge testament to you. Thank you. Um, again, I ask, you know, be better if people were proactive, too. I, I, I do advocate that. Don't wait till a family member gets sick or something happens, because everyone knows someone around them, unfortunately, now that does have cancer, mm -hmm. or, you know, ADD, ADHD, autism, obsessive compulsive behavior, Tourette syndrome, you know, seizures now, uh, obesity, diabetes. These are all um, the state of our children's health is what I call it. That's all the umbrella, under the umbrella of where we are with our children. And this truly is the sickest generation um, because of uh, our modern society, really, the way we live and the toxins from everything from our food, our air, our soil, the way we grow food, um, the way we take care of our land, and a lot in everyday products that we buy and bring into our home, the way we build our homes, um, and also through medicine, um, you know, where our children are literally being inundated and bombarded with these toxins, like constant hits, you know, and there comes a tipping point with everyone, and it's not a one-size-fits-all, and unfortunately, that's the direction of where the solutions have been with medicine is, you know, a one size fits all and it really isn't. And the more I feel our center can focus on our mission with identifying those factors and then doing something about it, whether it's research or implementing a program, um, that's where I think it's successful because then we prevent our children from being exposed. Right, and I wanna talk like what companies have done and what they're doing, like, we'll talk big picture towards the end, but. Back to this center and the research that you're doing, like you, you put serious white papers out 
with serious research. I mean, when I was there, there was this chalkboard, and I felt like I was in, uh, sorry, a whiteboard, and I felt like I was back in physics class. And God bless the delightful young woman who tried to explain it all to me. But there's some serious research going on. Can you give us an overview of what you're looking at over there? Yes, and that's really important to us. Um, Erin I, it was probably Erin I at, yes. at our center, mm -hmm. who's brilliant. She's brilliant. our, uh, she is, she's brilliant. And she's she's uh, coordinated and been part of and published all of the research that we've done to date at our center. And it's been significant going back to something as simple as head lice, Tracy. I don't know if your kids ever got it and people don't want to talk about it, but- oh my God, my son just had it like six months ago. He said he's almost 17, I wanted to die. Well, it, see, it's common. Six to 12 million children in this country get head lice. And it, it's not a fun or you know topic to talk about. And I don't know if you want to reveal what treatments you did, but they're all toxic pretty much what the doctors recommend and what's out there on the shelves. They're very toxic. They're basically saponified pesticides and insecticides that you shampoo in your kid's head. And that is not good at all. I mean, it's it's an exposure that is more toxic and more harmful than the lice itself. And that doesn't make sense, right? Right. Um, right. And potentially those ha have led to problems with children using these, you know, uh, products. So we did a study that's peer-reviewed published study that now um, we're trying to implement throughout all of pediatrics and get into something called the red book even, which is what pediatricians look at when they look for different remedies for things. It's kind of a protocol that they go by pretty much. And to get all those toxic products out, um, we showed with our study that you don't have to use those toxins. And, and the product, we were actually using a product, product and it's completely benign and non-toxic, and we proved that it works 100%. So the efficacy was even better than the extremely toxic products. So it's it's things like that that are like one little thing, it seems like, but those, um, I call them hits, but those hits that your children receive as they're developing and growing, they end up having an impact, For whether sure. ultimately your child has learning impairments, or frankly, lower IQ. A lot of these things are, are linked to this whole generation now with lower IQs, learning impairments, uh, you know, the spectrum with Asperger's and autism and um, uh, dyslexia. I mean, there's, there's a whole spectrum here. And frankly, a lot of those, asthma, allergies, they're in epidemic proportions. We've never seen it in any other generation what we're seeing now. And so that's why these, these things are so important to address. And to get you know real change made, and that's really what the core of what we're doing. Well, Focusing I think I think the study she was trying to explain to me was about the BPA, the plastics that we use, right, and the BPAs and yeah. how harmful they are, and to women especially when you're pregnant and things like that. Like, and and she even said the smallest little change, like get rid of the water, the plastic water bottles. That's just make yeah. one little change. It could make a huge difference. And it does. The thing with that, though, you bring up, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's an interesting thing that's happened. It's BPAs, bisphenol A. It's an estrogen and hormone mimicker in the plastic. It's a chemical that's used, and it's it's you know ubiquitous in our society with all the you know food packaging, plastic wrapping, not just baby bottles or plastic bottles, but it's in so many uh, food items and um, in products you buy for your home and cosmetics in personal care products, et cetera. So yes, we did that study to identify those levels, but what we found too is there are relatives of this chemical, BPA, and we found that even when the BPA was BPA free, you'll see, and that whole yeah. uh, movement that we helped um, educate the public about, they've replaced it with other chemicals that we found, and this is what our study was also helpful with, that are just as toxic. So the other part of this, it's important that when we identify a toxin and we're all saying, you know, let's not expose our children to it, or we're trying to ban it, or we're trying to change a way, you know, a company's working because of the chemicals and we know what they're causing. Um, there has to be a reality of an alternative, a healthier alternative. Otherwise, it really defeats the purpose, right? And that's why we go back to greening the cleaning all the time that's so successful because we did replace it with something that is so much healthier 
and works and is better. And same with the headlights um, uh, published study that we did. So that's still something that's a dilemma, frankly, with um, the BPA and the other, I call them cousins, chemical cousins are related that really um, affect our children the same way. But it's because it's like going on a diet and taking out the chocolate cake by adding ice cream, right? It's it's doesn't make yeah. it, it's ridiculous, right? But at the same time, yeah. we're in this society. It's we're so busy. Everyone's running around, and the first thing you do is grab the first thing you see off the shelves. And nine times out of ten, they're not really great for you. So then, does the onus fall on the food companies? You know, the the Pepsi's of the world, is the McDonald's? Do we? Do, is it there? It's up to them now. A big part of this um, is, and I'll say it big pharma, big agricultural industry, the big chemical industry. Um, and when you say food, the food industry, the food industry has really been hijacked by the agrochemical industry. So if it, for, for example, if you're not, if your diet is just grabbing those things in the grocery store and yes, everyone's busy and they're not organic and they're not GMO free, meaning they're not, gen you don't want food that's genetically modified which has glyphosate in it, which is a whole other subject about a chemical that is doing a lot of harm to all of us and our children. Um, those, that's, those are huge, huge companies that are driving this. And so we're no longer really eating healthy food. You really have to go to the source of eating um, as, as like whole food, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts and grains and seeds. Uh, and truly look for the ones that are, you know, GMO free, non-GMO and organic. It's, it's so important also to support then those farmers that are taking the time to have healthy practices so that we're not, you know, this damages the soil too. There's soil evaporation. The soil has been ruined, but there's so many heavy metals and contaminants in our soil that even to try to grow healthy food, it's very, very difficult now. Um, in this country and around the world, because of these the bigger picture, like you're saying, it's it's taken over on us. So that's a big part of this. Is um, you make a great point here because like there's many farmers out there that won't grow healthy food because or corn or potatoes or whatever because they can't sell it, right? They're only growing things that they could turn around and I guess sell to the the agri uh, industry because at the at the end of the day, these farmers are you know they're struggling to make ends meet. Yeah, and it goes against them. Don't you find it interesting? The government will subsidize all the non-organic food, meaning the food that has poison in it and is grown poison. Don't you find that interesting? This all becomes very political. Food is extremely political, and people need to wake up to that and and really use their voice because they, sh to, in order to protect your children, you need to know this information in order to properly protect them. And that's a big part of it is these big industries are... They spend a fortune in D.C. with the lobbying companies. They're, the lobby, and that lobby is what drives the market. Those companies, those huge companies, are the ones that dominate, and it makes it very difficult for um, you know the the organic farmers. But if they're gonna, why are they subsidizing all this? That's not healthy. Why won't you subsidize organic then? Why you know the if you look right. at it, the government doesn't do any of those things. You know. Um, so that's, that's another huge issue, but there are big, big companies out there that it's unfortunate because they are really poisoning a generation of children. Now, I'm not being, I'm not even being melodramatic about this. There's, you know, a lot of evidence to back all this up. It's counterintuitive though, isn't it? We're in the middle of a healthcare debate where our healthcare costs are through the roof and we, you know, we can't seem to figure the system out. And yet what we should really be thinking about is the future and how we're going to keep kids, right? Preventive medicine. I mean, John Scully, former Apple CEO the other day said, he bets that in 10 years, no one's drinking soda anymore. I don't know, do you think that's true? Like, do you actually think that it's a mind, cause it's a mindset, isn't it? It is, and what would be his reason? Like, what would they be drinking then? Just that soda has become so taboo and, the, and that the word is getting out that it's so bad for you. And this is a man who used to work for Pepsi, by the way. That well, it's so I agree with him, by the way. I don't drink soda at all, and I don't advocate anyone drink soda. So I agree, but I have trouble seeing, like, how that's going to come true because the, these companies, the big companies, like you just mentioned, Pepsi and Coca-Cola and the rest of them, they dominate, they're enormous, and what they do is then they morph into, like, they have water, right? But then they have flavored water. And, you know, it's interesting, that whole connection with soda. 
Um, not until the 1980s did they start adding the high fructose corn syrup to um, sodas. That made a huge difference because high fructose corn syrup also has levels of mercury in it. And that obviously is extremely harmful. Um, so there's been big changes in pharmaceuticals, vaccines, of course, a huge issue. Um, the food chain, because of these huge agrochemical companies that are basically um, poisoning the food chain, um, this all has an effect. And even something as simple as soda, now that you see they have like not only the diet sodas, but then they make it appealing where it's zero calories. Well, you got to look what's in that even. I mean, then they're adding more chemicals is what they're doing. You know, all those fake sugars, um, which are frankly worse. But, so but how, there do we, are how do we combat this? I mean, you know, you could even, we could even talk about the EPA and what's yeah. happening right in DC now today with that. I mean, do you worry about our next generation? I mean, these kids, I, I almost feel like the odds are stacked against them. Well, and they are, when you look at the statistics of one in 60 children have autism, mm -hmm. and that's one in four boys, four to one boys wow. ratio. Mm -hmm. four, yeah, four to one boys, one in 60. In New Jersey, by the way, it's one in like 40 to 43 right. have autism. Mm -hmm. I know. See, it's so and no one, is, no one is, you don't see the government and, 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 the, and, the, and these health um, uh, leaders speaking out on that. In fact, there's a level of denial about it that, you know, you have controversy. Well, they'll claim that, well, autism was always there and it doesn't. No, no, no. I mean, I work with way too many organizations with all these families that have a child with autism. It is absolutely devastating. And when you have an epidemic, we know there are no, there's no such thing as a genetic epidemic. This is directly coming from, and you see the numbers where they've grown and where they are with these, these one in 60 across the board, across the country, that's a safe number to say, and they're much lower even in certain states, state by state, even county by county. Um, there's something very wrong there because that's an environmental connection. And there's a lot of denial going on with people at the top in the, in the medical field. It's but is that, is that, I mean, look, I'm, Jer I'm in Jersey, right? So I mean, now I worry about my future grandchildren because thank God my kids are beautiful and fantastic. But so what does that mean then? Does that mean it's the, is it in stuff in the ground? I mean, because then this is an EPA issue, big time, right? Is it in the ground? Is it in the air? What, how is this happening? Yeah, we all need to come together. It needs to be the EPA, the CDC, the NIH, uh, even the Department of Defense, frankly. Mm. It's mm. all connected, um, all of Washington, frankly, all the, um, you know, the Senate and the House. This should be a priority. When you see numbers like that with autism, when you see a steady increase in pediatric cancer, not a decrease, when you see, you know, epidemic proportions with diabetes, obesity, ADD, ADHD, and then all the prescriptions and the meds that children are put on at a very young age, that is completely abnormal. That, to me, is not how you treat a child in a healthy way. Um, there's a certain level, to me, that it's, it's negligence. Um, and so the parents are left with, they have this beautiful child, and then they get a diagnosis, and then what do they do? And then they're relying on, you know, the system. And the system, frankly, isn't coming clean and being honest about how they can prevent and not being in denial about some of these statistics and that we should come up with much healthier ways to help these children. And it's just across the board, it is not being done. Um, there's more, way more damage being done. So what do we do? Like, you know... I, I've, I've kept you longer than I wanted to. We could talk all day, but what 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 should people be doing? Uh, how do you know? Other than going to speak to my congressional leaders, which unfortunately feels like it gets me nowhere. What do we do? I know a lot of people think that, but then if you can join or work with an organization, or even with our center, we do a lot of that. There's other organizations that are also down there lobbying. You know, health organizations, environmental organizations, children's advocates. But on another level, just as a parent. People need to get educated. They really need to take the time so they know the difference. N know about all the toxins or the pros and cons with, you know, your or eating an organic diet, first of all. Let's start there. I mean, there's many studies done where children that were taken off a diet with, you know, quote, conventional diet, which is a diet with pesticides, all the fruits and vegetables and all the food grown with pesticides versus 
that a child put on for several weeks, an organic diet, they saw significant improvement in their cognitive skills, their IQ, their learning. That right there, just yeah. going and focusing on food says a lot. Um, you can detox your body much healthier if you're much better if you are uh, being exposed, which our children are. They're being inundated by all these. But the other thing is in, in your home, too, um, you know, use non-toxic green cleaning products. When you use pest control, which everybody does, use integrative pest management. Don't let them come in and don't buy those cans of all those sprays that we know. You know, and they've been around forever, but I'm telling you, they do a lot of harm. Um, to use integrated, like I use, we're on this ranch here, Tracy, and our <laughs> Imus ranch on 5,000 acres, all those years for 20 years, taking care of those kids, completely green, we built it. We're on 5,000 acres with 30, you know, 40 horses and sheep and buffalo and chickens and, you know, donkeys and, and everything. And, and we've never sprayed any top, any pesticides or insecticides or fungicides. Here in Texas, we're on this ranch here with, you know, 30 horses and cattle and everything else, and don't use any pesticides at all. There's no glyphosate being sprayed anywhere. And you know, if we if we can do it in these environments, and I've done it in, in New York City in, a, in, our, in an urban environment, it can be done and it is done. And people need to start seeing that. They can go to our website too, but they, can, they should seek it out because the information is there. And start with yourself and start with your family. Like me sitting here, if I weren't, I can't advocate all these things, I feel, like a phony if I weren't doing that myself. And I am, and I've been doing that for years. And I try, you know, every day, I learn something new every day and, and I try to make it healthier every day. But those fundamentals have to, have to they, they, it has to start there with the food and the pest control and the cleaning products in your home. And even if you're building a new home, being aware, like you saw the cotton denim insulation at the hospital when we, when we built one of the first green hospitals there on the campus when you walked through there, all that that was green. Well, I implemented that into um, my homes too. So, you know, there are those things. We we kind of paved the way for a lot of that. Um, so, you know, if you're doing that in a hospital, humongous buildings that can't afford to make mistakes like that, and um, I think that says a lot. That's huge testimony and huge proof. But but you know? I mean, but I think you, you said it earlier. It's cost effective now. Like it used, there used to be a time when buying organic was more expensive. It's actually not true. I see it myself firsthand. <laughs> and you mentioned the hospital, and people should really go watch the video because the, everything is recyclable. All the materials are recyclable. The, there's denim in the walls that they're using as insulation, right? And the floor planks. And um, Kyle, I'm, I'm going to say his last name wrong. Been. They're non-toxic, you know, with low or no VOCs, which are volatile organic compounds that are highly toxic. I mean, and, and then, of course, our whole food program that we've been working on all these years, really making it healthy, organic, you know, offering more vegetarian, plant-based focus, not frying a bunch of food, not junk food, even our vending machines, which you have them, and that's the reality. So you have these vending machines. Well, we were able to switch. I don't know if you saw it, Tracy. Um, Kyle would have maybe shown you, but um, walking you through everything, but he got uh, them to switch over to uh, uh, vending machines where it's all healthy snacks. You know, a lot of organic options in the little snacks that you can get from the vending machines rather than all that junk that you usually see. You know, even when you're visiting a hospital or you have a child in the hospital, you know, and that was the first thing I looked at and we looked at at the center was helping and working with a chef to design a menu for the women's and children's hospital that would truly give these children healthy but yummy, you know, like organic yeah. waffles, organic buckwheat pancakes with organic syrup and organic blueberries and strawberries. Something as simple as that versus what they would be eating. Right. You know, that's a huge difference. It's total. Oh my God, of course. Not to mention, yeah. you, you have to watch too. We, we got to see how they make honey right on the premises and our our intrepid camera guy went out there and was like in the middle of the bees. It was the coolest thing. All this stuff is fresh and fabulous. And and you, we mentioned Kyle Tafori, and he actually was named one of um, the 30 under 30 people to watch in sustainability, which is so cool. And you mentioned that it's part of the Hackensack is part of the Meridian Health Services now. A bunch of hospitals. Kyle's out there doing them all this way now. Are you guys eventually going to take this model on the road and say? try to get Columbia and try to get NYU and other hospitals like in the area to, or around the country to do what you're doing? Yes, yes, we, we're open to that. I mean, again, our team is small. Bonnie Eskenazi, the, uh, who I know you talk with, she's been with me pretty much since day one. And 
I'll tell you, she's exceptional. And, you know, all the initiatives that we've been rolling out over these last 15 years, she's a huge integral part of why we are successful. And we're a small, and Aaron, our researcher, like I told you, Aaron Ide, and Kyle, of course, and, and Larray, and then Jim and Nadine, I don't know if you met them, they're the ones in charge of the greening the cleaning. They're the ones, you know, that the business of our greening the cleaning is successful. Um, I credit the two of them, Jim Ronke and, and, and Nadine DeBrugio. So, um, you know, and, and that's all what's interesting about our model is it's non-for-profit, of course. Uh, we're a 501c3 under the hospital, um, and we're a department in the hospital. And when we implement, uh, that's one way we su sustain our center is through our Green in the Cleaning program. You know, it, it pays to run all the, the, the whole program itself and then to, to, to run the center. So we're a small team, but I always say we're small but mighty. So there's no, there's nothing frivolous, and each person is maximized at the center. They're focused. They're super smart. They're specialists in what they do at the same time, and everyone is completely passionate about what they're doing. And, you know, it's a handful of people directly in the center that, of course, we're, we have – we work with um, lots of people in the hospital. So – um, that's another thing that, um, you know, we're not this huge, you know, center with this huge budget and this huge, you know, all of these people that you need. And it shows you, too, I think, by example, that you can you can be that change, you know. You are. Um, you're like a, you're right. You're a small, little, mighty group. But you are making a lot of noise and a lot of people are listening. Deirdre, before I let you go, can you tell us like the website and like where everyone can come to buy products and to get more information? Yes, our website is environment. I'm, I'm sorry, imisenvironmentalhealth.org. So it's imis, my name, imisenvironmentalhealth.org. Everything yes. is there. You can get the products there. You can get tons of information there. It uh, comes right up as soon as you Google it, imis. It'll, you'll see it. It'll come right up, envir imisenvironmentalhealth.org. And then, yeah, you're right. It has everything there. It's easy to navigate our website. We have a whole thing with all the latest studies and just the latest articles out. That's a fun part um, where you just click on that, like the, the green news of the day. And we constantly have keep parents and, you know, educators up to date on um, all the different um, articles that are out there uh, about everything to do with children's health and the environment. You know, everything from um, vaccines to food to pesticides to you know, how to build a better green home so your, your kids can be raised in a healthy, healthy environment, which all of those things are really important. But it's actually not that hard, Tracy. No, I, nowadays it's not, right? Because it is... It was much harder when I did it, because I was, when we founded the ranch, I was pregnant with Wyatt in 1998. In fact, I think, I feel like he inspired us to do all this, really. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's much easier now because... There, there, there is more access and there's more available to make that change happen. And like you were saying, the cost is there. It's not, and you know, that, that's one thing I want to make a note of. When you say, oh, people go on organics more, it's more to do this or that, and they complain, and I'm thinking, no, it's not. No, it's What's not. more expensive is if, God forbid, your, your child gets sick or has a diagnosis. That's forever a huge expense. So you got to weigh that, you know. Doesn't it make sense? Preventative, you're right. It's a great, great way to look at it. I hope everybody goes and checks out the site, at least buy the cleaning products, do something. And I, and, and I think you made the best point is that it just starts at home, starts small. And if you start to raise people who believe this way, then it actually does change the mindset. Because when they get out into the world, that's the way they'll think. And then hopefully the, they'll spread the good word. Yeah. Do My example, always. You're great. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's so good to see you. Tracy, thank you so much. Thank you. This is a privilege to be able to do this. Wow, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you.